Okay, I think uh, we start the second part of the morning. I have the pleasure to introduce uh, <coughs> Dr. Aral Engler. He's a, he's a senior researcher at the Institute of Medical Psychology and Behavioral Immun Immunobiology, University Hospital S in Germany. After studying biology, he obtained his PhD in, two, in, two, in 2001 at the Department of an Animal F Physiology, University of Bayreuth, Germany. He was then for two years a postdoctoral fellow with John Sheridan at the uh, Ohio State University, Columbus U in the States. Before, before joining in 2004 the group of Manfred Schledowski at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, Switzerland. Since uh, 2008, Arendt Engler is working together with Manfred Schledowski at the University Hospital Essen with the major focus on central and peripheral neuroimmune interaction. Please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Maestroni, for this kind introduction. Um, before I actually start, I would like to thank and congratulate Marco for putting together this really interesting uh, program. Um, when I was a student, I had the opportunity to attend at several schools and educational courses, and uh, most of them were about two days long, and I have to say this wide spectrum of uh, topics that you included in this um, educational course here is really extraordinary, uh, so really congratulations on that. So how can I contribute um, to this um, school? I will talk, um, uh, oh, by the way, where is this pointer? I can't find it here. Did Manfred take it home or? <laughs> the pointer? He took it? Okay, but I have to switch it now manually, right? Because I don't have this um, connection here. Well, I, I, I just switch it manually. So, you've seen this uh, figure several times now, and um, Manfred Jetlowski mainly uh, talked about this efferent part of communication with the, between the uh, central nervous system and the immune system. And I will mainly focus uh, in my presentation on this uh, bottom up communication, the communication from the peripheral immune system to the central nervous system. Now, why is this communication uh, so important? Mm -hmm. I have to do it manually. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, I read a very interesting report about the human microbiome project, not the human genome project, the human microbiome project. And, and this project is initiated by the National Institute of Health in the United States. And uh, what they basically do, they study um, all the microbial cells that colonize our body. So our skin and also inside the body. And what they found is that the microbial cells outnumber our human somatic cells by a factor of 10. So this is quite a lot and actually a little bit scary. But the good thing about it is that most of these cells are not harmful to us. They are quite beneficial. They are protective. Nevertheless, there are once in a while pathogenic microorganisms entering our body. And they, of course, can induce harmful diseases, infectious diseases, chronic diseases. And they can, be also, uh, they can also induce death. So it is very important for the body to detect these invading pathogens and the brain needs to be informed about such an event. So, oh. with our common senses that we have, like the vision, uh, the taste, the smell, and the auditory uh, sense, and the tactile sense, we are not able to detect these uh, pathogens. And in 1984, Edwin Blalock from the University of um, Birmingham, Alabama, he came up with a hypothesis claiming that the immune system could act as a sensory organ and basically as a sixth sense to detect these microorganisms. 
So in his uh, paper uh, in 1984, which was uh, in these days uh, published in the Journal of Immunology and uh, was just a hypothetical paper, um, he said the body cannot taste, smell, hear, see, or touch microorganisms, such viruses and bacteria. However, the immune system is well endowed with um, the molecular machinery to detect the presence of these microorganisms once they have gained access into the body. As such, the immune system alerts not only other leukocytes that the pathogen has invaded the body, but also informs the brain about this event. And this was quite revolutionary, this idea. And this was actually uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, 10 years before um, uh, pattern recognition receptors uh, had been described. Now, how is the immune system recognizing uh, pathogens? It is done by pattern recognition receptors. Um, these rep receptors here, for example, are shown toll-like receptors. Uh, now there are more than uh, 10, actually there are 12 toll-like receptors that have been described now. They recognize highly conserved structures on microorganisms, in microorganisms, and uh, for example, uh, parts of gram-negative bacteria or gram-positive bacteria, um, double-stranded and single-stranded RNA from viruses. So without previous contact, cells of the innate immune response can identify pathogens just based on these molecular patterns. And by inducing, by detecting these patterns, they induce a cytokine response. Here it is shown for lipopolysaccharide, uh, which is a component of the uh, cell wall of uh, gram-negative uh, gram bacteria and via intracellular signaling pathways. Um, these uh, molecular patterns finally induce the uh, secretion of cytokines, different cytokines. And what is shown here is uh, data from a uh, human endotoxemia model that we are using in our lab. We inject or infuse um, healthy volunteers in our lab uh, with very, very tiny amounts of endotoxin and monitor then the plasma cytokine changes over time. And what you see here is that there's a, a ready increase of TNF-alpha and interleukin-6 early after the injection, and then a little bit later, anti-inflammatory cytokines come up like IL-1 receptor antagonist. So it uses a wide pattern of different cytokines. And these cytokines, of course, play a very important role uh, in coordinating and orchestrating immune responses. So the major focus for an immunologist, of course, is to look on these complicated interactions, how the immune response is regulated, initiated, and also terminated. But these cytokines do not only affect immune responses, they will also finally affect our behavior. And there's one type of behavior which all of you have experienced before, and this behavior is sickness behavior. Cytokines can induce sickness behavior. It is a complex and coordinated set of behavioral changes that develop in individuals. So each of us had maybe a childhood disease, an infection, measles, or a chicken pox, or uh, maybe a flu infection, or even during a common cold, you will experience fatigue, so you're more tired when you uh, have a cold. Uh, you do not like to eat that much anymore. You're anorectic. Um, there are certain cognitive impairments, so if you have to uh, perform in an exam, uh, your performance will not typically not be that good as it would typically be. There's certain social withdrawal, but this is very specific. You do not like to socialize anymore uh, so much with people that you don't know. It's different with friends or close family members. But uh, with foreigners, you do not like to socialize. Um, you are more sensitive uh, to pain. So hyperalgesia is one of um, the typical uh, characteristic uh, behavioral changes. And hedonia. So you do not like to enjoy doing things anymore so much. You're more apathic, you're more depressed, and you're more anxious. So for everyone who's not working in this field, um, all these symptoms sound quite uncomfortable, but banal uh, components. And um, we do not think so much about these behavioral changes when we have a cold. We're more concerned about um, uh, the infection itself. 
in the old days, uh, scientists thought, you know, this is just a side effect of an infection, but now we know that this is an expression of the reorganization of our priorities. So uh, when we show these type of behaviors, this is actually adaptive behavioral uh, change that helps us to cope with the infection. This is not only specific to humans. We find the same type of behavior also in animals. Everyone who is working uh, in an animal facility, working with animals, and has ever seen a sick animal, you will basically see the same symptoms as uh, you can see it in, in humans. Now, there's one difference uh, between animals and humans. You can ask humans how they feel. You can give them a questionnaire, um, how they feel, and you can ask them uh, to fill out this questionnaire. But in animals, it's different. You have to find ways to measure behavior and behavioral changes. And I have just three examples how we can do this in animals. So. I told you one of the uh, important changes in sick uh, humans, but also animals, are changes in social behavior. And in animals, you have the uh, possibility to measure social behavior in a so-called social exploration test. What you do is you put an adult animal together with a juvenile animal, a pup. And what the ad adult animal likes to do is uh, exploring this uh, juvenile animal. There are no aggressive encounters. They start sniffing at them, licking at them. So a social positive behavior is shown in such situation. However, this changes uh, when animals uh, uh, receive an injection, for example, with a lipopolysaccharide. You see here, in the upper panel, a uh, saline injected animal, which is several times exposed uh, to such a uh, uh, juvenile animal. And what you see is the social behavior, the social positive behavior remains stable over time. However, when the animals are injected with lipopolysaccharide, you see that there is a, a dramatic decrease in this type of social behavior. Um, the adult animal that is injected with LPS loses simply interest in interaction and exploration of this juvenile animal. And this is a very characteristic um, behavior that you can observe in sick animals. Another characteristic behavior is depression-like behavior. I told you that depressed mood is one of the uh, behavioral symptoms of sickness behavior. And this can be measured in the so-called forced swim test. What you do is you put a mouse or a rat in a container with, with water, and they don't like it, of course, so they start swimming and struggling to get out, which is not possible because there are gla glass walls and they cannot get out. And um, animals that show depressive-like behavior, they stop, certainly, uh, swimming and struggling, and they just start floating. They blow up like a balloon, basically, and start floating. This is not just smart, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a sign uh, of depression uh, in these animals. How do we know that? Because when we inject the animals with antidepressive drugs, like uh, the diazepam or so, um, then you can induce, uh, uh, then you can completely abolish, abolish this type of behavior. And when you inject animals with LPS, then you see exactly the same, that the total time of immobility of this floating, what you see here in the right panel, is increased in animals that received LPS. So this is a clear indication that these animals show a more depressive-like behavior. Another test that can be used um, to, to measure behavior in sick animals is the so-called open field test. Um, you have a large arena, a bright illuminated arena, and in this arena, which is unfamiliar to, to your experimental animal, the animal is placed right in the middle of this arena. And what you typically see in a saline injected animal uh, is that it starts walking around in this arena and uh, goes mainly in the, on the wall side uh, along because um, these animals are sigmotactics. They like to uh, stay on the side of walls. And in an LPS injected animal, this pattern changes. The animals uh, do not move that much anymore. I don't know if you can really see it very well. It is very bright on the beamer. The animals uh, do not move that much anymore, and they also avoid the center of the arena, which is more 
threatening to them. And here is basically the result of such an experiment. You see that LPS induces a dramatic drop in locomotion in the, such an arena, also in the explorative behavior, and they uh, show increased uh, anxiety, which is here shown as a decrease in the number of entries to this center zone, which is more threatening to them. Now, I told you these experiments uh, demonstrate that LPS, in particular cytokines, uh, can induce behavioral changes, can induce uh, sickness behavior. And the question is now, how can cytokine signals enter the brain? Cytokines are quite, la quite large molecules. They have a size about uh, 5 to up uh, to 60 kilodalton, so really, really large. And they can be glycosylated and phosphorylated and then are even larger. Now, the brain is protected by a barrier. Uh, so molecules from the periphery cannot easily access uh, the brain because um, this is a blood uh, vessel in the brain, a capillary in the uh, uh, cerebrum. And what you see here is uh, that this capillary is layered with an endothelial cell, and the connections of these endothelial cells are the so-called tight junctions, they prevent uh, really access of larger molecules from the periphery to the brain. So if you have such a selective barrier, you of course need to have transport mechanisms uh, and ways how molecules from the periphery can be transported to the brain. So small molecules like water-soluble agents and ions can uh, partially actually uh, go through these tight junctions, but larger molecules have to go through the lipid layers like lipid-soluble agents, hormones, steroid hormones. They will enter the brain by this uh, diffusion process. Then for nutrients like glucose, amino acids, or nucleosides, there is uh, a specific transporter systems, and such transporter systems have also been described for cytokines. And there is um, a receptor-mediated transcytosis, for example, for other types of hormones, insulin and transferrin, and also for cytokines, such uh, receptor-mediated transcytosis has been described. There are areas in the brain where this blood-brain barrier is incomplete, not uh, fully built as it is in the other brain areas. And these are the areas around the large ventricles and also the uh, smaller ventricles, uh, which is indicated here in red. So in these areas, like the area postrema in, in, the, in the brainstem, the choroid plexus, the median eminence, the organum vasculosum of the lamina terminalis, and the supraphonical organ, uh, this blood-brain barrier is incomplete, and cytokines can enter the brain actually by volume diffusion. So there is no such barrier, and they can just uh, go across uh, uh, this uh, normal endothelial cells by diffusion process. So to summarize basically all the mechanisms how cytokine signals can enter the brain, um, this is uh, summarized in this slide here. In areas where it's an incomplete blood-brain barrier, there is uh, the possibility of a diffusion from cytokines that are produced in the periphery, for example, under the influence of lipopolysaccharide. And in these areas, cytokines go, can go right into the brain, only in small concentrations. There are cytokine transporters that have been described for certain cytokines, IL-1 and TNF-alpha, for example. Um, brain cells or cells, epithelial cells of the blood-brain barrier, so the cells that constitute the blood-brain barrier, they also can carry uh, toll-like receptors, pattern recognition receptors, and then can produce second messengers, which then on the inner side, on the CNS side, can activate neuron and astrocytes. And there is a neural way, which has been mentioned by Manfred just in his presentation, the vagus nerve, the sensor, the sensory vagus, but also um, sensory nerves from uh, the orofacial nerve or from the oropharyngeal nerve, they can enter the brain and induce activation of neurons in the brain. So there is also a neural pathway. Now, how do these immune-derived signals, once they are in the brain, affect the activity of the brain? 
Now, in the old days, I shouldn't say in the old days, it's still very common uh, to do it. Um, uh, people looked at the expression of uh, immediate early genes. Um, CFOS, it is a proto-oncogene, is one of these immediate early genes. And um, CFOS is induced by many factors, the expression of CFOS, growth factors, or neuromodulators like neuropeptides or neurotransmitters, but also an increase in intracellular calcium concentration will finally induce the expression of this proto-oncogene CFOS. But also other um, um, immediate early genes will be induced. And what you can do is, for example, after activation of a brain area, you can stain this brain area, you can do an immunohistochemistry, and uh, what you will find then is uh, these black spots here, which is indicating activated neurons, CFOS positive neurons. And this is a good indication for neuronal activity, but it is just an indirect marker, because what you measure is not the electrical activity of the neuron, you measure the expression of a protein. So you see there's, there are certain disadvantages by using this technique. First of all, it is time consuming. Second problem is you have to euthanize the animal to get this picture. Then you only have a snapshot. So only one slice, basically, which tells you this neuron was activated or not. And there is a time delay, because the expression of this protein in CFOS takes time. Just the mRNA takes about half an hour, and if you want to detect the protein, it takes you another half an hour. So from the initiation of the activation of this neural until the expression of the protein, it will up, uh, take up to one hour. So this is certainly a disadvantage of this technique. And uh, we... Besides, uh, nevertheless, you can use this technique to identify areas in the brain that are activated under the influence of LPS. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can't read it, but you don't have to do. Uh, but it's just to illustrate, on the left side here are vehicle-injected animals, and there are many brain areas here that have been uh, investigated. And what you see here is basically areas that were activated, showed increased CFOS expression two hours after injection of LPS. So there are several areas that showed a strong increase in activation, and this can be summarized in this slide. You come up with a network of, of neuronal regions in the brain that shows activation two, three, four hours after inducing an immune response in the periphery. And no matter what you inject, whether you inject IL-1 in the periphery, whether you inject TNF-alpha in the periphery or LPS, you will always see activation in these areas. So these areas seem to be essential areas and an important brain circuitry which is activated after a peripheral immune activation. Now, I told you this is just an indirect way of measuring neural activity in the brain, and we want to know, of course, uh, what is really going on in these brain regions. And therefore, we picked one of these brain regions, the central nucleus of the amygdala, to have a closer look on what's going on in this brain area for several reasons. First of all, this amygdala region is very important for the behavioral conditioning uh, Manfred was talking about. Secondly, the amygdala is an important part of emotion regulation, and many behaviors are uh, regulated by amygdala-dependent uh, mechanisms. And third, the amygdala is also important for autonomic regulation, which also uh, plays a major role uh, during an immune response and immune regulation. So when you do CFOS immunohistochemistry, chemistry, you can look uh, on CFOS expression, of course, and what you will see in the central part of the amygdala here in silane injected animals, you do not get that much uh, of activated neurons, but in LPS injected animals, you see a clear increase in activated neurons, not so much in the basolateral amygdala. So we wanted to know what's going really on in this brain area, and we thought we need to uh, use a technique that allows us to follow the same animal over a longer period of time after injection of an immune-activating substance like LPS. 
So what we did is uh, we implanted experimental animals with um, electrodes in the amygdala, and these electrodes were then connected with a socket unit, which was then fixed to the skull of the animal. So after surgery, after the stereotactic surgery, the animals look a little bit like a little computer. And in this socket unit, you can plug in a radio transmitter system. So it is possible, basically, with this kind of setup to measure electrical field activity in the target area, which is in this case uh, the central nucleus of the amygdala, over time, over several hours and even days. And you're able to monitor how the electrical activity changes over time. So we did this, and what you can see here is that in normal saline injected animals, this activity remains relatively stable over time. Whereas in LPS injected animals, there is an increase in electric activity about two hours after injection of LPS. It does not start immediately. It goes up about two hours after the injection. There is a clear increase in electric activity. So obviously, this area is getting activated after a peripheral immune activation. Now, how can this activation be induced? What you can see here is that the amygdala receives a lot of input from noradrenergic neurons uh, in the brainstem, and therefore we wanted to know um, whether the release of noradrenaline in the amygdala is increased during um, LPS treatment. So we used a different approach to do this. Uh, we implanted uh, experimental animals with a so-called uh, microdialysis probe. And what's, uh, what's happening there is we, we do a stereotactic surgery and implant a guide cannula. And during the experiment, uh, we can remove this dummy, insert this uh, uh, microcapillary, and this uh, microdialysis probe is then constantly perfused with artificial cerebrospinal fluid uh, at a rate of a very low flow rate, 1.5 microliter per minute. And during this uh, perfusion process, you basically get an exchange of uh, molecules in this target area, which is, uh, in our case, uh, the amygdala. And in your perfusate, you will be able to pick up, basically, uh, changes in the uh, composition of this um, uh, um, Cerebro, uh, artificial cerebrospinal fluid. So you can collect this perfusate, inject it into an HPLC system, and measure the amount of noradrenaline which was released during this perfusion in this specific brain area. And you, if you do this over time, you see in zeline injected animals a pretty stable signal over time. And when you inject the animals at this point with lipopolysaccharide, you see that there is also with a delay of about 100 to 120 minutes an increased release of noradrenaline in the amygdala region. And this is a clear uh, indication um, that the noradrenergic neurons that are projecting to the amygdala are obviously more active and inducing than finally activation, neural activation in the amygdala. We also wanted to know whether um, this is inducing uh, a de novo synthesis of cytokines in the brain. And what we did is we uh, sliced, the we, we uh, utilized animals at certain time points after saline or LPS injection, sliced the brain, did uh, coronal sections of the brain, and punched out this area which we are interested in, the amygdala to measure cytokine mRNA expression. So two time points, 150 minutes and 200 minutes after LPS or saline injection. And what you see is at both time points, there is an increased expression of IL-1 beta, an increased expression of IL-6, and an increased expression of TNF-alpha. We decided to do it uh, at the mRNA level to demonstrate that this is not uh, cytokines that are coming from somewhere else, but that this is really cytokines uh, that are produced on site in the amygdala de novo. Now, 
Another question that we had is how does these neural changes, changes in amygdala activity correlate with behavioral activity? So we picked two time points and looked at uh, open field behavior at these time points. At an early time point here, 60 minutes after injection of LPS or saline, where uh, saline and LPS injected animals do not differ in amygdala activity and also not in uh, noradrenaline uh, levels and noradrenaline production in the amygdala. And what you see is at this time part, the animals do not differ also in behavior. However, when you look at a later time point, for example, 180 minutes, when we clearly see a difference in neuronal activity, then there is also a clear change, a difference in behavioral activity. So you are able basically to measure both neural activity and behavioral activity in the same uh, individuals, and you are able to demonstrate that uh, there is a clear relationship between the behavioral changes and the neural changes in a certain target area in the brain. Now what happens when you inject LPS not only once, but twice? And there is a phenomenon which is known as uh, endotoxin tolerance. When you repeatedly in inject the rat with LPS with increasing doses of lipopolysaccharide, you will actually induce kind of a tolerance. After a single injection of LPS, these are the plasma levels of interleukin-6, uh, inter interleukin-1-beta, interleukin-6, and TNF-alpha. There is, of course, a strong increase compared to saline injected animals, which basically do not show much of cytokine produ production in the circulation. In animals that receive repeated injections of LPS every day, a single injection over a period of five days, there's a clear reduction in peripheral cytokine production. So they produce much less TNF-alpha, I6, and I1-beta than animals that only once received an injection with LPS. And when we looked here at uh, uh, um, neural activity in the amygdala after a single in uh, injection of LPS, our hy hypothesis was, of course, when you get a reduced production of peripheral cytokines, that also the neur neuronal response in the amygdala will be weaker. But this is one of these uh, experiments where you have a certain hypothesis and then you finally see that your hypothesis is wrong because what we observed is completely different, something completely different, the opposite basically. We found that the neuronal activity in the amygdala increased dramatically uh, uh, while the um, release of peripheral cytokines was much lower. We do not know currently why this is happening, but obviously there's a kind of a sensitization process in the brain that after repeated injections of uh, lipopolysaccharide, there is an increased activity uh, of, um, in the amygdala, uh, despite the fact that the peripheral cytokines, cytokine levels are much lower. Now, uh, we thought, you know, we have already very many data about changes, uh, LPS-induced changes. What is happening when we induce a uh, bacterial compound uh, that is from gram-positive bacteria? LPS comes from gram-negative bacteria, uh, and which is inducing a completely different immune response than endotoxin. And what we did is we used a Staphylococcus enterotoxin B. Staphylococcus uh, Coccus enterotoxin B is a, a toxin from Staphylococcus aureus, a gram-positive uh, microorganism. And what it does is basically it cross-links, it's a super antigen, it cross-links MHC2 class molecules from antigen-presenting cells with the T-cell receptor of T-cells and it induces a strong T-cell response. And of course, we also monitored the activity, the neuronal activity in the amygdala after injection of SCB and what we observe is that there's a different picture emerging after injection of SCB. It comes up earlier, the signal in SCB injected animals and then the, you have kind of several peaks in these animals. It's not uh, uh, the same picture as in LPS. 
And of course, we also thought, you know, we repeatedly inject SEB as we did it with LPS to see what's happening after repeated SEB injections. And again, a completely different picture emerged. After five injections with SEB, we do not see a sensitization process, but we see a blunted response uh, of the amygdala to this uh, repeated injections of SEB. So if you use two different immune stimuli, LPS or SEB, if you administer them once or repeatedly, you will always get a different picture. And uh, therefore, we currently believe that different immune stimuli leave basically in the brain different neuronal fingerprints. And by this way, obviously, the brain is able to detect different pathog uh, pathogenic threats in the periphery. And this is obviously very important for the organism to basically also make behavioral uh, adaptations and uh, uh, physiological endocrine adaptations. Um, another question that we had is what is happening if you do not induce or inject a substance which is inducing an activation of the immune system, but rather a suppression of the immune response? And Manfred just introduced um, one drug, cyclosporin A, which is uh, inducing a, a clear suppression of um, T cell function via an inhibition of calcineurin activity. And we thought, you know, it would be really nice to see when we inject this kind of drug into our experimental animals to see how uh, neuronal activity in the brain is affected. But we only, not only used cyclosporin A, we also used rapamycin. And also, rapamycin suppresses T cell activity, but by a different uh, signaling uh, pathway, because it inhibits uh, the molecular target of rapamycin mTOR. So there is a suppression of T cell uh, activity after rapamycin, uh, uh, similar to that what we observe in cyclosporin A, but the mechanism of suppression is different. We compared these two substances. First, we injected cyclosporin A to our experimental animals, and what you see is that even the injection of an immunosuppressive agent, such as cyclosporin A, you will get an increased activity in the amygdala. And when you inject an uh, rapamycin A at similar uh, potency, then you will basically get uh, the same picture. So. The two substances, although they uh, suppress T cell activity via a different pathway, they will finally induce a similar pattern of neural activity in the amygdala. And this was uh, quite impressive to us that both immunoenhancing but also immunosuppressive agents finally induce changes in neural activity in the brain. Now, at the end, oh or the last part of my presentation, uh, I would like to show you that not all of these uh, behavioral changes that we observe in response to cytokines are always adaptive. In the long run, these uh, sickness behaviors can lead to the development of uh, mood disorders, for example, such as depression. Now, what you see here is uh, that cytokines induce sickness behavior and the sickness behavior peaks around two to six hours after the injection of, for example, LPS. And in the background of this sickness behavior, another type of behavior, depression-like behavior, emerges, which peaks then around 24 hours after the injection of LPS. And the reason for this is that pro-inflammatory cytokines induce, on the one hand, sickness behavior, but these pro-inflammatory cytokines induce also the activity of an enzyme in macrophages, the enzyme is IDO, indolamine dioxygenase, and this enzyme uh, degrades tryptophan, which is the precursor for serotonin, and increases uh, kynurinine, which is a metabolite. And this can finally then induce depressive-like behavior. Now that these are completely, or not completely, but independent behavioral uh, changes can be shown by selective inhibitors. In one case, you can block both behavior, sickness behavior and depression-like behavior by injection of minocycline. 
which uh, acts anti-inflammatory and will block basically the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And if you inject solely one methyl tryptophan, which is an inhibitor of IDO, then you will only block depressive-like behavior, but not sickness behavior under, after an in peripheral injection of LPS. Now, this um, IDO, this activation of this enzyme IDO in dolamine uh, uh, dioxygenase, uh, I told you it degrades tryptophan uh, through the kinorinin pathway, does not only induce depressive-like symptoms, it can also induce via the production of kinorinin uh, uh, different um, metabolites, kinorinic acid and kinolinic acid, and these uh, metabolites have different... Um, effects. Um, kinorinic acid can induce cognitive dysfunction, for example, whereas kinolinic acid can induce actually oxidative stress and can finally lead uh, to the production uh, of uh, or can lead to the uh, degeneration of neurons. So what you see here is that depression can be a consequence of exaggerated signal, but it does not have to be. You have to have certain uh, prerequisites that uh, from a sickness behavior, uh, depression-like behavior develops. And what you see here, a systemic infection induces, of course, the production of peripheral cytokines and the activation of uh, brain pro-inflammatory cytokines. This typically leads to changes in neural function, which then will finally lead to changes in behavior. However, if you possess certain risk factors for pro-inflammatory or inflammatory disorders like rheumatoid arthritis or colitis or these kind of infect, uh, chronic, uh, chronic uh, inflammatory diseases, then you're prone to show exaggerated sickness behavior. And if you, in addition, possess certain risk factors for mood disorders, for example, a polymorphism for the serotonin transporter, then this may lead to a decompensation and then to the development of clinical depression. So a simple adaptive behavior as sickness behavior is, can develop under certain conditions if you possess certain risk factors uh, on the immune level or at uh, the neural level to the uh, uh, development of a mood disorder or a neuropsychiatric disorder. So during my presentation, I was hopefully able to show you and give you a brief overview that an infection or inflammation can induce why these afferent pathways, so from the bottom to the top, via cytokines, I didn't talk about prostaglandins, but they can also induce uh, similar changes, and via uh, the vagus nerve to changes in behavior. Sickness behavior is one of these adaptive behavioral changes, but in the long run, uh, when, you, when you observe an exaggerated uh, cytokine production, it can also lead to the uh, de development of mood disorders such as depression, and it can lead to neurodegeneration. And this is actually something we would like to investigate in the future. Uh, that using the animals that I just showed you before with these implanted uh, electrodes and with these microdialysis probes to monitor animals over a long period of time to see how these changes in neural activity uh, correlate with the development of um, depression-like behavior in our animals. So at the end, I would like to thank all the people um, that helped uh, to contribute to these kind of experiments. Of course, the people here at the University Hospital in Essen, but also uh, from our former institute in Zurich, the people that help us with microdialysis and uh, telemetric uh, EEG recording from the University of Leipzig, and then, of course, Adriana Del Rey and Hugo Besedovsky from the Philips University in Marburg, who help us with the uh, catecholamine uh, measurements. Thanks for your attention, and I would be happy.